Welcome to the Project Endure podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me just say that we get it. Personal development can be hard, but you don't have to do it alone. Project Endure has been on a mission to create a supportive and inspiring community of people, all striving to be better together. Head down to the link in the show notes and join the Hard Things Club so that we can do hard things together. And if you're already a member, invite a friend and spread the love. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 125. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very, very, very special guest down in Dallas, Texas, my man, Daniel Flores. Daniel, what's up? Hey, what's up, man? Thanks for having me here. Excited to have this conversation with you, man. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. Uh, For a little bit of context, you and I had weekly phone calls for four months, essentially, leading up to the Leadville 100, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And I feel so privileged to have learned so much about you. And I'm so excited for this conversation because I still feel like there's more to learn. Before we do any digging, uh, how would you introduce yourself to the people listening who don't know who you are? I would start with, my name is Daniel Flores, born in Mexico City, and I moved to the U.S. when I was 10 years old with an amazing mom and an older brother. Then uh, we moved to Dallas, Texas, and uh, yeah, we had to endure, persevere, many difficult things. You fast forward, and uh, we're, we're here, you know, still pushing, still going. And uh, I'm really into the endurance sports lately and uh, into building meaningful things. You said that so casually. I'm really into the endurance sports lately. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get to it, but you completed the Leadville 100, which is no small feat. Um, but before we go there, I would love to hear more about childhood and, and more about coming to the United States, because I know that's a big part of your story. So do you mind giving us a little bit of background as to what brought you here, what it was like to get here, and then how that all unfolded? Yeah, for sure. So I'll take you back to when I was living in Mexico. Uh, I lived there for 10 years, and uh, my parents split up. Then uh, my mom and my brother, we decided to move to the U.S. to pursue a better future. We got to the U.S., and we didn't know English we wanted to figure it out from the very beginning as far as the culture, the language, and being able to pay what we needed to pay in order to survive. So that is uh, the immigrant journey, you know, being able to start from scratch and learning as we went through this year's like the beginning stages of living in America. And yeah, at a very young age, I started selling homework. So I wanted to contribute in some way. So I was in middle school selling my homework for a dollar. And then uh, you fast forward to like the high school days, still like trying to make some money, selling my lunch from the cafeteria. And uh, yeah, eventually started a small business at the end of high school. I was painting curves. And uh, I learned a lot about business, a lot about sales there, then uh, transition to a a lawn care business. So overall, you know, it's just the story of someone that wants to make it, someone that wants to put in the work and is willing to do whatever it takes to make it happen. Mm. I love that. I don't think I've shared this on the podcast, but in middle school, I sold gum. Uh, me and my friend would go to the the store and we'd buy, I don't know, a pack of gum for maybe a dollar and 50 cents. And the pack would have like 16 individual pieces and we would sell each piece for 25 cents and make a profit. And 
it got shut down though and the principal caught wind because gum gum was illegal in school you weren't allowed to chew gum in middle school so we were essentially doing illegal business in school but i also had that spirit within me from a young age and i admire that and i think the process of building things is so 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 cool so exciting so important for all of us whether it's a business or just building ourselves and in order to build like you and i have talked about behind closed doors you need to have a solid foundation and so to start the conversation of what does daniel's foundation look like i would love to learn more about the hardest thing that you've ever had to handle so the hardest thing the hardest season the hardest circumstance that you did not get to choose for yourself what was that daniel I would say growing up here in the U.S., being an immigrant and being able to do it without a father. So being able to do that for 10 years from middle school days all the way to, to high school. For me, that is something that made the man that I am now, just being able to go out there and get what's mine and no handouts pushing through obstacles. And every time I look back, I'm grateful for that, even though it was a difficult thing and I didn't sign up for it. It made me stronger mentally. And I'm super grateful for that. I am so curious to hear what 10 year old Daniel thought at the time, because it sounds like Daniel in this current moment is grateful for certain aspects of that journey. What did 10 year old Daniel feel? Uh, moving to the U.S. without a, a present father. Man, I remember when I was 10 years old, it was more about why me, why us? Like the cards that we were dealt were pretty difficult. So it was more about like proving something and having that chip on my shoulder of wanting to to make it work. But yeah, it took a few years to really look back and be like, you know what, like I'm grateful for that part of my life because in a way I had everything. So I had a family, I had love, I had peace, appreciation, and all of the things that I value. You know, overall I had that, but it took a few years to to realize that. I'd love to talk about that chip, the chip on the shoulder, that dark side, if you will. Um, it's something that you and I, again, share in common. It's a place where I've always been able to draw from when I, when I need it. However, over the years, I've also realized that sometimes that chip or that, uh, that negative energy, if we hold on to it for too long or if we hold on to it all the time at the forefront of our minds, it can become toxic. And it's almost like if you hold this bitterness within you, it'll just eat right through whatever it's holding or whatever's holding it, I should say. And so I'm curious for you, are you still able to tap into that chip, tap into the dark side? Does it still exist now that you're grateful for that season or has it gone away? Yeah, no, that's an interesting question because I can still get to that point of being able to tap into it. But now I'm able to manage it. You know, before it was out of control and I didn't know any better. It was like lack of awareness. But then now I understand, okay, this is what's happening and I'm going to use it to fuel myself for something positive. So I believe, yeah, we do have that in common. And I use it for my races. I use it for just difficult moments. And yeah, it's cool to be able to kind of turn the light on and off and being able to use it whenever it makes sense. Mm. So I'm going to ask you a question that you do not have to answer. You can just say, let's move on. And I'm okay with that. But if somehow this podcast made it to your dad and he was listening to our conversation right now, what would you say to him? If anything, I would say that I have love for him, even though he wasn't there and, you know, really needed him when I was young. I'm at a point where I'm at peace and I, I like, I would like the same for everybody. So yeah, love and peace for him and hope he's doing well. 
<laughs> That's such a great answer. I love that. Um, so, all right, with that being said, tell me a little bit more about why your specific background coming from Mexico is still so important to you today. And then we'll transition this into Leadville at some point. But why is being Mexican such a big part of who you are? Yeah, and I would say more than Mexican, being a Mexican immigrant. Mm -hmm. So I understand, you know, what it's like to be a Mexican immigrant, leaving things behind, coming to this country. And I understand the struggle that I lived and many other immigrants live. So being able to understand that and use it in a way where it drives me to go the extra mile. And at the same time, it drives me to voice those struggles, those stories of other people as well, is something that I really care about, you know, because I believe there's greatness in the Hispanic community here in the US. And uh, I want to be able to really put that out there. Hmm. Now, when you set out to take on Leadville, I would love to go back in time and learn about what was going through your mind when you found out that you were accepted to run the race. And then we'll fast forward. We'll work our way from there. But what was going through your mind when you found out you were accepted? Man, I was pumped. Uh, I was excited because I applied. It's a lottery-based race. And it's something that seemed impossible. And I remember when I signed up for it, I had just completed an Ironman 70.3. And I thought that was very difficult. And the day afterwards, I was like, okay, let me look for something that's more difficult. And when I started doing the, the research, I was able to find Leadville 100. So knowing that there's this goal that seems impossible and the odds of making it are not really high. Uh, you take a look at the probability of finishing it. And it's usually about like a 50, 50 percent. And for me, like that's really what gets me going. Like knowing that there is a chance of making it, but at the same time, there's a chance that I'm not able to make it. So that makes it exciting. So whenever I found out, I was like, okay, let me come up with a plan. Let me come up with a team because I'm going to put in the work that's needed in order to be prepared for this race. Hmm. So before I ask for any more details about Leadville, I'll ask the question, what is the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose and why did you choose to do that thing? The hardest thing is Leadville 100. Yeah, physically, mentally, it was such a big push. And uh, man, I think about it every day, but right? it's, it's such a great memory. And yeah, that's the, the hardest thing that I signed up for. And the question was, why did I sign up for it? Yeah, I would say when I first signed up for it was to see how far I could go physically and mentally to push myself. But as I started training, I realized that in order for me to have that training block and be consistent, I needed to go deeper than myself. So being able to understand why I really wanted to do it, you know, it really came down to wanting to go for something that seemed impossible. I was willing to put in the work and also I had all the desire to, to make it happen and wanted to use it as a way to represent the Hispanic community here in the U.S. where, you know, we can go for those things and we can put in the work for it. And uh, eventually, you know, we, we can make it happen. So for me, like that is the driving force behind Leadville. And uh, yeah, I'm so grateful because we worked on it together. You know, we started to go deeper into my why for it. And uh, yeah, by working with you, like I was able to tap more into it. So I appreciate you for that, man. Of course, man. I appreciate you for giving me that opportunity. It was such a pleasure to speak with you every week. and learn more about yourself as you were learning more about yourself. And the one thing I want to point out here is that the fact that failure was not only possible, but 
almost probable at Leadville didn't deter you. It made you even more excited for it. I think that is such a rare perspective to have. And I would love to dig into that a little bit more before we keep going. Where did that come from? Have you always been excited about maybe not being able to finish something? I think that's something that deters a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I would say from a young age, being able to go around a neighborhood and knock on doors to sell a service and getting rejected. You know, I was rejected when I was a kid. They would shut the door, no thank you, on to the next one. So just being able to be comfortable with something not happening, like to me, that's something that is still is true to this day, right? So you can be doing sales and the customer is like, not at this time, like, does it work right now? Okay, on to the next thing. So yeah, I think that builds up and eventually you have in a way calluses to, to know or failures and you learn a lot while you're doing it. I think that's where a lot of the growth happens when you fail. And then what do you do to get better? Right? What do you do to, to improve? And to me, like that's the exciting part as well. So a couple of things to point out there. One is that you were calloused through repetition of being exposed to failure, being exposed to rejection, being exposed to those no's. And I don't think that's something a lot of people get exposure to early on, which is another reason why your story is so fascinating that you were knocking on doors at a young age, just starting business after business, just to make some money to help support your family due to the circumstances that you found yourself in. And so I think that's awesome. One. Two, one thought that often goes through my mind when I am facing rejection or when I get a no or in building this business, something doesn't turn out the way I want it to is if someone told me, Joe, you need to ask a hundred times and you will get 99 no's, but the hundredth time you ask, you will get a yes. I would be out knocking on doors right after this podcast. I would go knock on a hundred doors. And yet most of us are so afraid because we're not sure entirely if that yes will ever come. And we might not be willing to endure those 99 no's to get that one yes. And again, through repetition, you and I both know that is possible. And you and I have both learned through that process how to do it better so that maybe it only takes 80 doors to get that first yes, maybe only 60 the next time. And we're okay with that. And so to bring it back to Leadville, you and I talked about what it would look like to fail. You and I talked a little bit about what it would look like to not finish the race. Do you remember those conversations at all? I do. Yeah. And I remember those conversations and I believe that the same thing to me, the failure component was something that I knew could happen, but it wasn't going to define me. Like I knew that the attempt of going for something and doing the best that I could day by day, week by week, month by month, by being able to do that, to prep for the race, to me, like I was already a champion. My mindset was like already won. Then you get to Leadville and it's a huge race. A lot of things happen. But in my head, I was like, man, I already won. I'm going to continue to push. So once I ended up crossing that line, it was like an amazing feeling just being able to have that mindset. But I knew that, you know, failing was definitely a probability there. I wasn't scared of it because I knew that it was just going to make me better. Mm. So I've got the man in the arena quote from Theodore Roosevelt on my office wall, and it's been there since I had an office, since I left my job. But I'm going to share a quote from Brene Brown, which is a play on those words. She said, when we spend our lives waiting until we're perfect or bulletproof before we walk into the arena, we ultimately sacrifice relationships and opportunities that may not be recoverable. We squander our precious time and we turn our backs on our gifts, those unique contributions that only we can make. And by showing up for Leadbuilt, by stepping into the arena, by not being afraid of the potential that that failure could be your reality, you didn't squander your gifts. You didn't sacrifice the opportunity. You chose to show up and you got it done. Spoiler alert. 
And so we're going to talk about all of that, but let's fast forward to maybe race week, Daniel. I would love to hear what that was all about. And then we'll talk about the race in detail. Yeah, no, sounds good. I got there about a week before to get used to the altitude and just to start prepping with the, the logistics. And I remember when I got there, man, I was nervous. I was like, man, this is a big deal. Like my body is about to go through something super difficult, lungs, heart, legs. And I would say the first two days, like I, I was struggling to get my mind right. And I would get some runs in, nothing crazy, two, three miles. Then uh, I had my team uh, showing up about like three days after. Then I would go to the airport, pick them up. And that's when reality started to kick in. It's like, okay, people are actually flying in from different parts of the U.S. to, to support. And, you know, I was grateful for it. Then, uh, you know, got the map out and started to strategize the, the plan of uh, accomplishing this goal. And I remember I met a lot of cool people there at Leadville. I remember at a coffee shop, I was able to, to see people from social media, from IG. And then they were sharing a lot of uh, game with me. So Mike there. And, you know, he just gave me his game plan. And I was like, okay, this is super helpful. Then uh, back at the, the cabin, man, that was so cool. It was like one of the, the best times, just having family, friends, all in one place, sharing a meal, talking about life, doing introductions. A lot of us didn't know each other. or I, I knew them, but they didn't know each other. It was cool to know how cool the team was as far as everybody was there to accomplish a goal and this goal was to complete the race and he taught me a lot about selflessness people going there and it's not really about them it's about the mission so from the crew to the pacers to myself like it was for a bigger purpose then um i would say the day before the race, that's whenever I started to prep and, you know, got my fuel ready, my food. And man, it was a, a rough night. I think I got like five hours of sleep or even less. I went to bed at 9 p.m. and it just I couldn't sleep. I was just excited. And uh, race day came and, you know, I woke up. It was like 2 a.m. And at 2 a.m., man, I was ready. Like, I loved how that week went of starting the week, being nervous to like, okay, getting used to it. But then race day is just like I was locked in. Like, I was ready to, to go for it. And in a way, I didn't have any emotion. Like, I wasn't excited in a way. Like, I wasn't sad i wasn't yeah i couldn't feel anything i was just like there's a mission and i remember i was like so locked in got into the car and then uh we had like four cars like driving to to leadville and i was in this like hunting mindset of like okay i'm, I'm gonna do my thing i tapped in get there 3 30 a.m and then the race starts at 4 a.m so like to me like that's what's really nice about these races that once it's race day like it's just go time and that's where i feel my best and uh yeah that's how i started like that that was the the week prior to to the race i love the lead up there and it's it's funny i was with mike harkins who is episode 121 of this podcast this past weekend him and i were catching up and you came up in conversation we were running together and he was telling me a little bit more about Leadville. And he told me that he walked into uh, that that establishment and he saw you and your crew sitting there mapping things out. And he already, he realized you guys were mapping out the same plan that he had already created and he just gave it to you. And I love that there's so much collaboration and teamwork. And yes, you're there to compete. Yes, you're a competitor. And at the same time, you also want others to do well. 
and you're there to build bonds and connections through that hardship and through that chosen adversity. Uh, so I love that. And with that being said, however you want to do this, Daniel, I would love to hear the story of Leadville from your perspective, from mile zero to mile 100, however you want to tell it, we're here for it. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. And yeah, no, I completely agree. As far as a community goes, everybody wants each other to win. Like when you're doing this race, it's not about like where you're going to place for most people. It's just like, Hey, we want to get this done. So being able to share ideas, share the game plan, like that's something that I, I really appreciated. And uh, yeah, man, he's a great guy. Got to run a few miles with, with Mike and uh, I'm glad we met there in person, but uh, yeah. So let it build 100, man. It was an amazing experience. Like I mentioned before, I think about it every day and it just changed my perspective on life and how I do things. And uh, first of all, you know, shout out to my team. You know, it's one of those races that in order to be successful, like you need a, a solid team. And I was so fortunate to have my family, my friends show up and support, we had a, a solid game plan. So the chief crew, his name is Lewis, showed up and he ran Leadville last year. So he shared a lot of his experience and, you know, we actually did like a drive run the, the day before, just going to like different aid stations. And then, uh, yeah, my brother, huge support as well, you know, being able to to help with the crew moving from one point to the other and you know when the race started it was 4 a.m and i knew that it was a long race which meant that i had to keep uh, a conservative pace and my goal was to get to the first aid station so that's about 13 miles and that's called may queen and went there it was dark out there and I remember, so I've been, I watched videos, different documentaries about the race, listen to podcasts. And it was so cool to go run on these same trails and just see what I used to see. So the first component was like running around a lake and everybody has a, a headlamp. And man, it's just like a movie, like you're living it. And then the sun comes up and you see the, the lake for the first time. And it's like, wow, like, this is beautiful. And then I got to the first aid station. That's where I saw my team. And uh, a lot of places will say, hey, don't have a team there. You know, it's just 13 miles. My team showed up there and, you know, they, they supported. And it was a, a good, like, dry run as well. Like, hey, this is what it's going to look like. Pit stop was there for five minutes and that was a game plan like every time i would stop i had a, a five minute time for me to refuel get my electrolytes carbs so did that first section and that's just the, the beginning i was like the the warm-up then the next one is you have to go and for the first time like that's when leadville is real you're like man you're going downhill it's called pipeline and people are just like rushing it but based on you know what i read i was like man i gotta be conservative but man i did my first 26 miles at a, a slow pace and i'm talking 12 to 13 just feeling good enjoying the the views i knew that i had a lot of time you got to the other aid station so that's at war bound and man that was like one of the, the coolest moments that's when the team is there like you see all the teams for the first time and everybody's cheering each other and you get a lot of just love and support from the people that you appreciate and for me like that was really the fuel like yeah you need the electrolytes you need, you need the carbs but just the positivity from your team and like seeing them work together and like laughing and, you know, having this common mission, like to me, that's how I was able to recharge. I was like, okay, 
like yeah I'll, I'll get my fuel but this is more meaningful to me like seeing the, the whole team there and uh so outward bound that is a key spot there's usually like two spots where most of the, the teams stay at so that's mile 26 and then the next one would be twin lakes and from outward bound to twin lakes it got super hot so I believe this is the race that has been one of the, the hottest races in, in the past few years. And I remember like feeling it at the same time coming from Texas, like to me, like that was normal. And for me, like that was the first time where I was like, you know what, like this is a flat portion of the race. I like the heat. So I was just running and it felt good. I, I was moving. Heart rate was very low, like a hundred and. 40 and the goal was to always be below 160 for me for the first half that was the the strategy and then for the the fuel component it was i had two bottles up front and that was carbs and electrolytes and then i had a bottle on my back as well that was just straight up water so every time there was an a station like my goal was to finish everything before so i could refuel and i got to twin lakes i believe that's about mile 40 something again like you see the whole crew there people are excited it's, looks like a party there and uh, i got to see them for, for five minutes and you know the cool thing about having a team is everybody has a role and the role is super crucial so i had someone called a spotter right that i would be running and as I was getting close to the aid station they would spot me and then they had a drink there waiting for me so we would walk jog together to wherever the team was and I got to drink that while I was going that direction then I would sit down and again it's like a pit stop I had someone with a timer and that was uh, a five minute timer so i knew exactly what time it was then uh, someone with electrolytes and, and the carbs then another person with the food they would ask me what do you want to eat and i didn't have a lot of options it was english muffin or english muffin so yeah we'll get an english muffin and i ate so many of those it was uh, it's crazy and uh so i got the, the gels as well and um yeah, the, the whole team did an amazing job in that aspect. I had someone with biofreeze as well. Every time I would sit, you know, that, that was a, a key thing to do there. And after Twin Lakes, that's when you head towards Hope Pass. And you have to go up a mountain, get to the other side, turn around, go up again, and come down. And the caught up time, I believe it's 10 p.m. So I had about seven to eight hours to to make it happen. And I would say that's where the race really starts. Like you get to Twin Lakes and you cross this lake creek. So you get your, your feet wet and then you start to go up this mountain. And you know, this is the part where I believe changes your perspective. It changed mine for sure on the way back. So I remember going up and fortunately for me, I knew what it was like to go up the mountain because I visited Leadville about two months before with my brother and we did a, a hike as uh, bros, got to the top. So like I knew what it was like to get to the top. Now I had no idea what was on the other side. And man, that was one of the hardest things. So like you get up there and you start seeing people slow down and in a way like that starts messing it starts messing with your head of like, oh man, like okay, people are struggling here, which means that it's just a matter of time before I get to that point. And uh, you know, I kept going and got to the top and I was like, okay, timing is, is solid. Then you start to come down the mountain and it took forever to 
I'm down. Like I thought it was gonna be easier, but yeah, the other side is a little tricky. So went down and got to Winfield. So Winfield, that's a, a 50 mile marker. And man, I remember I had some noodles there. It was like three cups of noodles and I was able to just refuel there. Ate some uh, mashed potatoes too, man. I was mixing mashed potatoes with noodles and it was like the best meal ever, man. Like I've never done that before. But uh, yes, I did that. And then on the way back, like that's when the race, in my opinion, like really starts. Like on the way back, it's so steep. Your legs are super tired and you're at mile 50 plus, like 52. Like you're trying to come up the other side and you know it's going to get dark eventually. So the goal is to get to the other side before it gets dark. And man, I was struggling. You know, I think that's the first time where I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it to the caught up time. And that's when the why started to kick in. It's like, why am I doing this? And to me, I'm doing this to, to show that you can go for things and like you can push through. And, you know, the whole thing of like, si se puede, like you can do it. And I remember just thinking about that and I was like, okay, like it gave me energy to continue to push. Then I thought about four things, like four things really helped me finish this race. So one was the why, and that's the, the si se puede, you can do it. Two, I was talking to, to God. It was a very spiritual moment for me, just like being able to pray and like have a deep conversation with God and just being able to trust him that, you know, this was something that in a way was going to help others and just being used as an instrument to, to make this happen then the third my team right they were all putting in a bunch of work and it was my job to do my part so it was like you know they flew from all over the place they're doing it with almost no sleep i can't let them down you know that like i gotta continue to push and then the the fourth it was thinking about my younger self 10 year old daniel like i, I needed to be that hero for him couldn't quit. I wasn't going to quit. So, you know, I would think about that. And I was like, man, I, I gotta be my, my hero, like my younger version of myself. I, I gotta be, you know, Daniel's hero. So I continued to, to push, got to the top. And once I got to the top, I was like, you know what, like we're, we're in, like we're about to just go downhill from here. It got dark. So I was coming down whole pass and the mountain when it was dark. And I actually twisted or sprained my ankle, my left one on my way down. But I was like, you know what? You gotta keep going. So I kept going, kept going. And then uh, eventually got to the bottom of the, the mountain. It was already dark. I was really tired. And I believe I had like an hour of cushion before the caught up time. And then I was running and I didn't see anyone. But then eventually I saw one of my teammates and he flashed the light. He was like, hey, let's go. And then that's when I knew like, okay, it's game time. Like, you know, we made this happen. And that was one of my favorite moments. I would say the favorite moment, getting to Twin Lakes at like 9 p.m. And the team was there with a ton of energy. I ate a hamburger. Everybody was just laughing. And I could just feel that energy of like, they were excited. They were probably worried, like, yo, where is this guy? Like, it's been uh, a few hours and like he hasn't come down the the mountain. But yeah, just like seeing them excited that I was alive. And then uh, you know, it just made me go harder. So that's whenever I picked up my first pacer, Jeremy, and we went into the night. You know, I remember got my fuel, got some uh pre-workout for the first time I was like you know I gotta wake up a little because that's uh like the 9 p.m to like 2 3 a.m shift and uh did that so Leadville is 50 miles one way 50 miles back I was a little familiar of 
how the, the trail was on the, on the way back. And once I got to mile 72, that's when I was like, something is wrong. Like it hurts. It's when I got my blisters and they were horrible, like so big and painful. And I remember I went to an aid station and they looked at them. They're like, man, this is pretty bad. Like, it, uh, we don't know how you're going to do it because it's mile 72 and you still have like 30 miles left. So every step that I was making, it was painful after mile 72. And that was like, you know what, like, what can we do? Can we just wrap them? And they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap them. And they did that, continued to move forward. But man, it was so painful and it got super cold too because I was moving the entire time. And that was like the first time I like sat down inside this tent and then you come out and it's freezing. At least like to me, that's how I felt. So it's cold, it's dark, got blisters. And then I was going to see the team in a few miles. And that was going to be my first time where I was going to show that I was struggling. So the whole time everybody was you know, excited, happy, but I just felt really bad. So I come with the bad news. So saw the team, I got mile 78. There's this uh, place called Tree Line. So it's like an unofficial aid station. Got some electrolytes there. And I remember the team was like hyped. And I stopped and I was like super direct. I was like, I got some blisters. I need your help on the next aid station. And then that was it. And then, yeah, the mood changed. So it went from like a super like happy race to a uh, man, we don't know what's going to happen. So I met them at the next aid station. And uh, fortunately, the team was able to help me with, with the blisters a little more. And yeah, I mean, that's when I got the second pacer, Manny. And man, at that point, it was like 3 a.m. So that's like the 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. shift super tired and every time i would pee it wasn't clear like it was dark yellow and for those that don't know about this is like the pee has to be clear in order for you to like know that you're hydrated and it was just dark and i was like man I, this is not not good so i had to like just drink a ton a ton of water kind of slow down with the carbs and electrolytes and when it's dark, it's hard to see too. So it's like, man, with the headlamp, is this is this dark? Is this is light? Like, yeah, it, it was a struggle. Plus the blisters too. And yeah, eventually got clear. Blisters were always there, but I was able to just tap into this other like side of my my mind where I was like, you know what? Like, I'm just gonna accept it. It's gonna hurt. I gotta move forward. Like, I'm not going to quit because I have blisters. You know, like, if I'm going to, I'm not even going to quit. Like, the only way I'm going to get out is if, like, I'm not awake. Like, something happens. So, kept going, mile 72, mile 78, and then uh, eventually got to May Queen again, which is the last A station. Got there, and then this time I only had, like, 30 minutes of cushion. So, the time was just running out. Like it's one of those things that you feel like someone is behind you, like ready to like get to you. And it's the time, right? Because of the caught of times. So I got to May Queen and my last pacer was my brother. His name is Luis. And I didn't have time to sit. I didn't have a five minute break because I was running late. So it was like, all right, let's go. I got there about 5.30 a.m. Caught up time to the finish line is 10 a.m. And had to cover about 13 miles. So for the most part, it was a, like a power walk, power hike. And did that for about 10 miles. And then uh, realized that I was running out of time. Like I wasn't sure if I was going to make it because I was going a little slower than usual. And my team showed up at the lake and it was a surprise like nobody like no other team does that they showed up i saw my friend thing i saw lewis I saw my cousin steve and my friend edgar and they were like 
let's go. Like, just with a bunch of energy, like, hyping me up, hyping my brother up. And then that gave me that extra juice to like, you know what, let me start running more. And this is like mile 96, 97. So I'm like trying to run as much as I, I could. And that, that helped a lot seeing my team there. So that was super clutch. Then you get to like mile 97, mile 98, then you start seeing like uphills. You're like, man, are we doing more uphills? Like I thought we were like done with the inclines. But yeah, even to the very end, like there's a lot of inclines. And I remember doing that. And man, mile like 98, it, it was just a struggle. Like I was super tight on the time. And I remember Lewis, he showed up. He was like, yo, like you have to like do the run. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to like full send it. And I started running like 200 meters. I would stop and walk a little, run it, stop. Then eventually get to the, the final part, man. And this is the, the last stretch. I saw my team there. And this is one of the, the most beautiful moments too, because I visualized this part the entire time of watching documentaries is the street Harrison and the sixth street and just having my team next to me being able to be like hey like we did this thing and we're like power walking and then eventually I was like yeah let's run it so I finished I crossed the line running and that was 100 miles man but overall, man, it was just such an amazing experience that I visualized and I put in the work for it. Fortunate to have a solid team that showed up and did the thing. And man, at the end of the day, like, si se puede. So I'm, I'm, I'm staring at a picture I've pulled up on my computer of you crossing the finish line that I'll use for the art of this episode. and the look on your face i don't know if there's a, another way to describe it outside of just pure joy i mean you have a huge smile you've got the double bicep flex going which the biceps look huge i don't know how you kept them that big during this prep um and your team is around you and everybody just mouths open screaming cheering smiling and it's just a beautiful thing and you wouldn't know by looking at that picture that you had blisters on your feet. You wouldn't know by looking at that picture that you endured anything painful. You wouldn't know by looking at that picture that you were dehydrated. You wouldn't know that it was a struggle. You could say all those things. And I think a lot of people would think those things. However, you could also say that that expression on your face, that expression of joy could only be possible from having overcome something like you overcame. For having gone through all of that pain and discomfort and struggle those hundred miles and it's just this beautiful thing and i think lance armstrong said it best when he said pain is temporary it may last a minute or an hour or a day or a year but eventually it will subside and something else will take its place if i quit however it lasts forever and i never heard you once in in the past 15 20 minutes of describing leadville say the word quit that you even thought of it once was that a thought that crossed your mind at all? No. Yeah, no, I would say quitting was not an option and it, it wasn't. I was like, the only way out is a different way. Like if I can't, I can do it physically, like something happens. Mm -hmm. But yeah, quitting, not an option. And I think Si Se Puede goes so well with uh, a quote from the founder of Leadville 100, Ken Schlubler. I'm not sure. I think I, I said that so wrong. Sorry if you're listening, Ken. Uh, he said, you're better than you think you are. You can do more than you think you can. And it kind of goes hand in hand with si se puede. Yes, you can, right? Like you, you can do those hard things and you did. And so after the race now, you said you've been thinking about it every single day. What's next for you, Daniel? Man. Yeah, I do think about it every day. And I'm grateful for that experience because yeah, it really changed my my view on, on things. What's next for me? Man, I would say two things. Like one thing is 
being able to be there for others because I saw that experience of like people being there for me. So being able to support my friends with their races, being able to be part of a crew, like to me, like that's something that that I want to do. Like, how do I have that experience to help others like cross that line? And I would say aside from that, I want to build something. You know, a, a lot of the the runs that that I had, you know, made me think about what I want to do in the future. So for me, being able to build something meaningful and profitable is something that I've always like wanting to do and I've done, but now it's being able to find the alignment of what I value, what I stand for, and all those miles, all those conversations with you. Uh, man, I know there's something deeper and I want to build that now that I have a better foundation of who I am as a man. So what's coming up next? Well, I'm excited to watch those things unfold. And in the spirit of this podcast, having gone through the Leadville 100, I'm curious, what is your definition of the word endurance? My definition of the word endurance is being able to push despite the obstacles to get to a certain place that you have in mind. And yeah, that's what I would say for that. Yeah. And and you did that with Leadville and you were just to reiterate, prepared to go through that process, even if you didn't get to where you wanted to go on that first attempt. And I think that's important to throw out there because there are plenty of people who are pursuing things right now and either have fallen short, are falling short, or will fall short. And that definition of, an, of endurance uh, tells us that we can and should get back up and continue moving forward despite the resistance, despite the obstacles, if that thing is important enough to us. And so with that being said, Daniel, there are people listening to this podcast who are on the ground right now. They, they've fallen down and they're not sure how to get back up. And you get to speak encouragement to those people who, who are struggling, who are not sure where to go or what to do next. What would you say to somebody who's in one of those, those uh, seasons of life right now? I would say that it's in you to become the person that you want to be. Like you have what it takes to make it happen. And it's part of life. Like sometimes you have seasons where things are going great. Other seasons that things are not going so well. And being able to understand that and know that it's going to be okay. Shall pass on both sides. It's not going to be good forever. And it's also not going to be bad forever. So being able to push through the obstacles and see the sun on the next day, or eventually the sun will come up. You just got to continue to endure, persevere, and be grateful for what you have as well. Because like it might be a bad season, but I'm sure there's a lot of great things that you have. And sometimes we don't really notice it and it could be basic things like you know got two hands i have food i have water i have family or things that you know we take for granted sometimes but it's like man once we understand that we have a lot of things already that are positive like why are we complaining like let's get to work and get to where we want to be by by pushing ourselves and just to add on top of that and there's not much to add but it's something you already said many times in this podcast, which is you also don't do it alone. And surrounding yourself with good people, with the right team is so, so important. And one last question for you, Daniel, if somebody's listening to this and they don't have that team or they don't have that group or they don't know those people, where would you encourage them to look? Where would you look if you had no one at this moment to start building that circle? I would say Instagram like it is a good place of meeting people that are like-minded. And, you know, I would say for me, like tapping into the ultra world, I didn't have 
people here at home that ran a ton of miles. So being able to connect with others and in a way seeing where you want to be in the future and be like, okay, who are those people? What type of community are they part of? Then being able to tap into that community and start to get to know people. I think social media is powerful and I would recommend anyone out there to try that as far as like wanting to connect with like-minded people. So this is the perfect setup for my final plug. If somebody wants to connect with you, if somebody is inspired by your story and they think to themselves, man, Daniel is the type of person that I want to become, or he's doing the things that I want to do. And I want to reach out to him. Where should they do that? Yeah. So my IG is daniel.flores with two S's at the end. And yeah, I would love to connect with like-minded people. I, I learn a lot from others and get inspiration from others as well. So yeah, excited for that. I love it. Daniel, thank you so much for this. I appreciate this conversation. I appreciate you. Uh, and I know the audience is going to get a lot from this conversation. And uh, I'm just thankful for you, man. I appreciate you, man. Uh, it's been an awesome journey. You were a big part of it for this uh this year in general, man. So I appreciate your your friendship and your coaching. And uh, yeah, excited about the, the future, man. Me too, man. Thank you again. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing, if you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.